Okay, hi everybody. Um, this is my presentation. It's on if we all go global, what happens to the local? This is a defense of pedagogy in place. Mm -hmm. It was an article by Alberto Arenas. Um, I hope everyone out there is doing well. I just want to give a quick congrats to the Crow family. I hope everyone's healthy. Um, I hope everyone else is healthy and safe as well right now. Um, it's a really bizarre time. So hopefully we all get through this together and we all come out well on the other side. So let's get rolling here. So Alberto Arenas. Okay, so a little bit about him. Um, just bear with me. I'm recording this on an iPad right now. I had planned to do this at work, but we're not allowed in our school, so I'm kind of making do with what I have. All right, so here we go. Alberto Arenas. He was born and raised in Botaga, Colombia. He completed his PhD in 2000 from Berkeley um, in education. He currently is an associate professor of environmental and sustainability education in the Department of Teaching at the University of Arizona. And you'll kind of see this throughout the article, how he ties in sustainability, education, and environment all into kind of this big overarching um, theme, which is really, really cool. And here's a happy photo of the guy right there. So you can tell he's loving life and his job as a professor in education. All right, so I wanted to start with tonight just by covering a couple different global initiatives that we've seen in schools in the last little while. Uh, there's a lot of work talk about like global citizenship, um, global perspectives in a classroom, um, global thinking, you know, uh, with all this interconnectedness that we have in the world now through the internet, and technology, globalization, um, you know, we see a lot of people wanting to good, do good things with this as well, right? There's a lot of positive that comes out of these big global initiatives, and a big one is the Me to We program, right? That's where um, kids in Western or more developed, uh, richer countries will raise money and then go off and help build schools and poorer countries like in parts of Africa or um, in India um, and do a lot of good. So there's a lot of positives that come out of these things. So I'm not trying to um, make global initiatives and these big global ideas sound bad. They're not a negative, but um, what Arenas, or Arenas gets to in the article and what I kind of thought was interesting was how he's like, we need to slow it down and before we can actually get to this, we need to start thinking smaller, thinking at the local level, and then working our way up into these big ideas of global citizenship, uh, interconnectedness, and all this uh, throughout the world. All right. Okay, right, so what he um, talked about a lot in the article was the pedagog pedagogy of place. And this argues that children cannot comprehend even less feel a sense of commitment towards issues and problems that occur in distant places until they have a well-grounded knowledge of their own place. Okay, so he's saying you can't think globally if you can't connect it to the local scale. And I would say that's true in a sense. Uh, thinking of my own experiences as a science teacher, if I'm in an environmental science 20 classroom and I'm talking about climate change, it's really hard um, to get even grade 11 students to connect to, say, you know, why should they care about rising sea levels here in Saskatchewan? Who cares if the Maldives go under in 20 years? That's some place I don't even know. I couldn't find it on a map. So you always have to try to find these local connections. So what I would try to do more of nowadays is like show them models based on science that shows what climate change could do to Saskatchewan's growing seasons for crops in the next 20 to 30 years and how 30 days of drought in the summer might be an issue for them. And it helps them to connect these issues even more and make it more relevant. Um, so I'm sure we all have situations like that through different curricula, different age groups. And I'm kind of wondering, like, what age groups do you think this can start to happen and where we can start maybe branching out from maybe a local level and working out more to a global level? And where can we start? At how early of an age could we even go even and hit them with local level issues and topics and start talking about these things. Um, and are there topics that are just too complicated no matter the age group? Um, I would say, for example, maybe a global pandemic is a little too hard for even adults to comprehend at a global scale. 
until it hits you at a local level. I think a lot of people in the last three months of the news didn't really get too worried about the coronavirus because, you know, well, that was a problem in China or it was happening in Iran and Italy. And then not until the last two weeks when we've pretty much shut down, you know, most of North America has it kind of hit home for us. So I think there are issues like that that can be just a little too much for even, you know, sophisticated adults to think of. And also, what topics can you think of that are global in scale but benefit from being taught at a local level, right? Um, my example of climate change was one. Um, you know, I tend to be more of a math science guy, so any other ideas that you guys could bounce back and forth I think would be really cool. All right, so some causes and fixes that he identified in the article. The, the root cause is that he saw it as, as local people in power became educated in Eurocentric schools, they began to abandon local traditions, histories, and culture, all more in favor of a national and imperialistic views uh, that helped to lead to more power and growth and greed and whatnot. And I think we've seen a lot of that throughout history, and we've talked about that quite a bit in class too, that um, how this Eurocentric way of thinking and its you know, dominance has kind of led to a lot of local uh, traditions and histories around the world being kind of you know, whitewashed and pushed to the side. Um, and to fix this, he calls for more you know, experimental, experiential, cooperative, and environmental learning. Um, he recommends smaller class sizes, more teacher training, uh, more comprehensive standardized exams even, uh, where the exams are written more of a, say, a local level, and there's more per, um, emphasis put on studying these and working with these. Um, you know, he talks about more teacher training and experimental cooperative learning and getting kids kind of outside and exploring their local environments. But he also talks about how after that, they would have heavy tutorial sessions in the school that were mostly optional, but still heavily in favored by most kids because of you know, the deeper connections they were making to their learning. So he kind of pushes for a more comprehensive local level um, standardized exam. And I know we have, to some degree, we have some standardized exams throughout the province um, with elementary and middle years. We do have you know, reading and math assessments. Uh, in the high school, we do have departmental exams. Um, I've done a little bit of exam writing in the past for some of the departmentals. And I wouldn't say there is a very heavy push or emphasis to have any local content. You know, if anyone can, we try to every once in a while to kind of make it, you know, a little cutesy, a little more relevant. Maybe the kids will get a kick out of this, but there's not a lot there. Even in like a senior math class, you know, some of the newer textbooks mention things like Saskatoon or Winnipeg, you know, in hopes that'll get the kids rel uh, engaged. But there's not a lot of it there. And, um... So it was kind of interesting to think about it like that. Um, the big thing that he emphasizes is slowing down the machine. And um, I know in personal experiences, um, we've been able to, in some of my PD groups, you know, start at a grade nine level and map out all the senior sciences from grade nine up to you know, grade 12 chemistry, biology, and physics and kind of figure out different content, say, you know, at labs and demonstrations that you would do in a classroom and hands-on experiments and everything like that. But I've never thought about breaking it down and like, okay, where would I infuse this local content? And if I put this here in grade nine, what could that lead to what these kids should be able to know by grade 12? You know, looking at a bigger picture of the whole, you know, content of what I'm teaching. And I thought that would be really neat, you know, starting with local ecosystems taking the kids out on a, pa a, pa a walk along the pass along the river and building off of that and then getting into different things like, say, the sustainability in grade 10 or even then into climate change in grade 11 and kind of having this big overarching picture of how you could start at a local level and map out to the big global issues throughout. Now he looks at three, fundament, three fundamental interconnected realizations that come with the local 
um, pedagogy. Uh, one, he wants that people should acknowledge that education is political. Uh, so there should always be an acknowledging of unequal power relationships in society. Uh, those should be studied and looked at, even the one between teacher and students. Um, helping students develop a sense of compassion towards the plight of others. That ties in a lot with, you know, the empathy that I think a lot of school boards and schools are getting on board with teaching. So um, that's one that I think ties in really nicely. And I really like this quote, so I thought I would just include it. So while education should serve as an avenue through which students learn to adapt to society and change, um, change it when necessary, it is possible to adapt a pedagogy that makes students critically aware without reducing them to receive a particular ideology. Um, I really like that, um, that analytical piece there about um, receivers of a particular ideology, maybe showing different views to your students, um, letting them think critically about things, allowing them to form their own opinions. Uh, there doesn't necessarily have to be a right or a wrong. They don't have to adapt and fall in line with the teacher's way of thinking. Um, although the teacher, you know, talking about it in a political sense, is in a sense of, uh, is in a place of power in the classroom um, and does have a lot of influence over their students. It's not necessarily the end goal to have all your, you know, your class of 30 students um, to be free thinking as long as they think the same thing as you or maybe what the curriculum wants them to think, right? So that was a really interesting quote to me. Uh, the next one of the three fundamentals was education is environmental, all right? So there should be interaction between the social and natural world. Um, so this ties in with the experiential and outdoor education that he was talking about before getting kids outside the classroom, allowing them to explore things. Um, this kind of ties back into Alyssa's uh, Prezi from a couple weeks ago about getting kids outside a little bit more into nature, right? Um, so the knowledge and skills to, to be well in a sustainable manner, okay? So they want their kids not only to be educated, but to live well and healthy, but to do that sustainably. So what that means is with minimum environmental damage. And um, to me, that highlights a lot of challenges here in Saskatchewan. So we want to eat healthy and eat well all the time, but that can be tough, you know, to get, you know, fruits and vegetables in the middle of January. So we have things shipped in from South America, Central America, um, other things, you know, it, there is a much more heavier carbon footprint to live in this part of the world. Um, we rely a lot on transportation to get us around that burns fossil fuels. So that sustain, the sustainability piece, um, you know, sometimes it's easier said than done, but yeah. So these are always questions that you can always throw at your kids though, and it's really surprising what they can come up with for answers as well. And the third one here, this one I really did struggle with a little bit. Um, it's education is aesthetic, okay? So you want to bring art into your student's life, is what he argued. Um, and this didn't necessarily need to be paintings and drawings. It could be expression through a lot of different ways, through movement, sound, images, or materials. And I thought nature could be that material as well, right? Taking your kids on a nature walk is very aesthetically pleasing. There's studies on nature deficit disorder and the effects that just being out in nature can have on you. Uh, you know, it can reduce, you know, stress in your life after just a 30-minute walk. And I wanted to know, is there any other ways to bring aesthetics into lessons? <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe having them, you know, write a poem or... Um, come up with something else that allows them to express themselves creatively. Um, that one I kind of struggle with. I'm a very analytical, you know, black and white type person. You know, I teach math and science, right and wrong. So I don't really have an artistic side. But what I did see it as is that local education to me 
could really tie well into maybe physical activity and outdoor education. Um, those are two big passions of mine, is just getting kids outside to learn and to move and not just, you know, stare at an iPad and learn. So if there's ways to, you know, take a walking tour of maybe your, to see your local uh, town hall and learn a little bit about civics or, you know, there's a local pond that you can go look at and study the ecosystem. These are all great things that I think tie into just getting kids to move as well as learn. Um, so I thought that was, you know, a piece that I kind of saw there. Besides the three pieces of, you know, political, environmental, and aesthetic, I thought physical education and activity was another great one as well. All right, so in conclusion, there are gaps that Arenas talks about. Um, local government involvement, you know, um, maybe you do want your local city hall or municipal go government to be helping out more. Um, is that possible or is that something you really want? Do you want any political interference? You know, tough to say. School administrators, it can be tough if you don't have the support of your local administration uh, at the school level to back you. Uh, sometimes, you know, they're going to be more worried about test scores and evaluations and assessment pieces, which is my third bullet, than as opposed to having kids out and about learning um, in maybe in a non-traditional way. Okay, and then of course evaluation and assessments. Um, if you're doing all this, you know, experiential learning at the local level, taking kids out on local field trips and whatnot, um, it does take up a lot of time, right? It's really great stuff, and it's usually the stuff they remember the most, right? But it takes up so much time in the classroom that that can be a challenge at times. So what are some ways that you can include more local content? Like field trips are always a good one. Um, just nature walks, getting the kids outside, those are really easy. Um, but how can you incorporate that into more local content and issues into your class? What are some low roadblocks that you might face? Backlash, maybe some apprehension, funding. You know, if you're doing a local field trip, sometimes paying for a bus and a bus driver can be pricey. Um, and what are resources that other teachers can use? Are there things out there that I haven't, like I know I don't have the answers for everything on this. I'm just a guy that read this article about a week ago and wrote a PowerPoint on it. But like what are some great local resources that people could uh, utilize? I don't know, maybe put that in the comments section of this uh, in the YouTube page here and, and maybe have a discussion about that. You know, let's maybe take a few minutes to build up some resources that we could use. Because I think this is a great way to engage kids so, hopefully, I didn't go on too long. I tried to keep it around the 10-minute mark for this. I think I'm just around there. Um, again, I hope everyone's being safe and isolated. Um, and hopefully, I'll see you guys all again soon.